This is Thursday, May 5th, 2011. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus. We are privileged to have with us today Dan Hubbard. Welcome, Dan. Glad okay. to be here. Thank you. Thank you. And may I ask when you were born? I was born uh, May 24th, 1938. And where were you born? I was born in a little town called Athens, West Virginia. And what was it like growing up in Athens, West Virginia? Uh, it, I guess it was just like any other you know, youngster growing up. It was uh, a farming community, little town type. And mm -hmm. so it's, if you work on a farm, it's, it was good. I mean, mm -hmm. we didn't have no problems. We, everybody got along. Right. So you uh, actually spent part of your childhood during World War II. What was that like? Uh, it was a little rough because uh, my father was away, you know, in the army at that time uh, mm -hmm. during the war. So, but it got better. He came home. Okay. So. <laughs> uh, uh, where did your dad serve? Uh, he was in Germany. Germany. Did he talk about uh, his days in the war? No. Uh, but, from, you know, from what I can gather today, uh, maybe in the past a little bit, uh, he was quiet, mm -hmm. you know, like so many other people that came home. Mm -hmm. And uh, by being in a war myself, then I could understand why they didn't talk about it much. Mm -hmm. and, okay. and where'd you, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, where'd you get out of high school, graduate? Uh, I graduated uh, from <clears throat> West, uh, Thorn School in Princeton, West Virginia. After my dad died, mom moved to big town. <laughs> mm -hmm. How big a town was it? Well, it was bigger than Athens. <laughs> okay. So, are we talking central West Virginia, western West Virginia? It's uh, yeah, more in the southern tip. Okay. And when did you enter the military? Uh, when I first entered the military, it was 1957. And what branch? The Army. The Army. And why did you choose the Army? Well, I was just uh, a kid, mm -hmm. you know, uh, working little odd jobs back in those days. You know, you didn't get a lot of money. Uh, so, you know, whatever job I could get, it was, you know, 10, 15 cents an hour or something mm -hmm. like that. So one day I decided to go into service. Okay. And, okay, so you were in the Army. Where did you do your basic? Uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky. Any specialty? Uh, I was just uh, a scout. A scout? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm And what can you tell us about uh, your days in the Army? Uh, they were good. I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we didn't get to go a lot of places at that time, but uh, it was enjoyable being around other guys, you know, on age and doing the same type of work. And, mm -hmm. and where were you stationed? Uh, Fort Knox. For all four years? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Near the gold? <laughs> well, I was told it was there, but <laughs> I didn't get none of it. <laughs> okay, so after four years in the Army, what happened then? Uh, well, I, I, I was at home and uh, mm -hmm. I had a, a job making uh, $100 a month, which uh, I guess those times were fairly decent. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just got tired of doing the work for the city. Mm -hmm. So I went back into service. And but not the Army this time. You decided to join the Marines. Yeah, well, that, that's a, a funny twist to it because uh, when I went to the recruiting station, the only mm -hmm. guy there was the Marine. So, and I wasn't going to go back home. Mm -hmm. So I joined the Marine Corps and, uh, and the way it went. Okay, so tell us what uh, the early days were like. Well, the early days in, in the Corps was uh, taking a bus from my hometown down to Paris Island, South Carolina, mm -hmm. and arriving at uh, receiving uh, at the Marine Recruit Training Area at Paris Island. It, it was almost like, what did I do? Mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> why am I here? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah, recruit training, uh, 
it was different from the Army, but yeah, it was tough. You know, uh, I wouldn't say rough, but it was tough. Mm -hmm. It was uh, mentally taking you from a street, you know, and breaking you down to build you back up and to the way that the Marines mm -hmm. would build, you know. And I enjoyed it, mm -hmm. believe it or not, I enjoyed it. Uh, and after Paris Island, uh, I went up to North Carolina at Cap Lejeune, at the 2nd Marine Division. And uh, I went to infantry uh, training at uh, Camp Geiger up there, and then from there I went over to Mainside and joined the uh, 6th Marines, 3rd mm -hmm. Battalion, 6th Marines. And uh, we did a lot of field work, you know, going to the field, training this, training that. And uh, we got to go on a MIG cruise. Mediterranean, mm -hmm. so we got to see that part of uh, Europe and through the Mediterranean and you know Spain, Italy, and those mm -hmm. places. And uh, after six months there, we came back home, and uh, I was transferred from there to uh, the Marine Barracks in Charleston, South Carolina, in security duty. And uh, yeah, one thing led to another, and. Uh, you know, just security, you know, what you checking cars and people coming in on the base itself because it was a, a security type base. Mm -hmm. And that's where I met my wife. So she was the greatest thing out of my mm -hmm. whole tour with the Marine Corps. And uh, I think I proposed to her twice, but she says I did, and I said that oh, one time. But, uh, then we we were there. Uh, we got married there in Charleston, South Carolina, and uh, our first son, our first child was born. Mm -hmm. uh, 64, 65, I was transferred to Camp Pelton, California, and uh, so uh, then from there uh, I went to Vietnam. We sent over to Vietnam. And what did you do in Vietnam? Uh, I was a, a small unit leader. Uh, I had a squad in for a while, and then I had a platoon for a while and then in the first tour. Mm -hmm. uh, the second tour, uh, I was uh, a platoon leader, and then when we got an officer, finally came in, and he took over the platoon, and I went up to be uh, the company gunnery sergeant. Mm -hmm. And uh, then from there, uh, we just, uh, after that was over, uh, that was the second tour. So it was toward the end where we started breaking down, getting ready to come home, you know, and towards the end of the Vietnam period, mm -hmm. then I came home. And uh, so I uh, joined my wife uh, in California. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, uh, I went to, uh, Okinawa, Japan, mm -hmm. and uh, stayed over there a year, and uh, came back to the States, joined my family again, and we went to uh, Camp Lejeune, or, yeah, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and I was there for two and a half, three years, and that's where I retired. Okay, so you basically have just compressed about 15 years of the Marines into so many sentences, but let's uh, let's get back to the um, let's get back to the Vietnam tours because it wasn't one tour after the other. No, uh, no. Uh, in the first tour, uh, how long were you in Vietnam? Uh, Twelve months. Twelve months. Mm -hmm. uh, did you engage the enemy at any time? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, any stories from the first tour? Uh, not a not a lot. I mean, it was uh, yeah. We got into a lot of far fights and mm -hmm. stuff, but uh, and we were always. It seemed like when nothing was going on, everybody was happy, joyful. You know, mm -hmm. they weren't sitting around looking like statues or anything. You know? Right. Uh, but uh, you know, and uh, I was on a tank. We went out on an operation and uh, was on a tank and it hit a mine. And uh, that's where it almost uh, lost a lower leg, but 
that stayed mm -hmm. with me. So, mm -hmm. and uh, and that was pre that was pretty much it. Okay. Uh, and when did you go to Vietnam the second time? Uh, the second time was in uh, 1970. Mm -hmm. I was uh, I, I was up here on recruiting duty mm -hmm. in Connecticut, and that three years were were up. And uh, then I went back to Vietnam before I joined the uh, Third Battalion, First Marines, and. Uh, that was uh, that was kind of rough mm -hmm. for a while, mm -hmm. and uh, but we uh, lost my train of thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we uh, went out at at the time uh, a small unit leader. Mm -hmm. Okay, I had uh, uh, over a hundred. Combat patrols and, uh, and security patrols. So that was, I was busy in that tour. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was just handed a note. Ask about the Walking Dead. Well, that happened on the 12th day of May uh, in 1966. We uh, had a patrol to go out early in the morning mm -hmm. and uh, they called in. Has something to do with, a, with an animal, but it all boiled down to after they called in with that, then we heard shooting going on. So then the call came in that they uh, hit a large group of NBA. Uh, course, yeah, of course we took off to give them some help, and uh, but we managed to save two, mm -hmm. and the other 14 or so uh, was com completely annihilated, and. Uh, so I mean, we, we had to fight to get to them, but uh, mm -hmm. but we did get to them eventually. Mm -hmm. and, but like I say, we did save two, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and the others were kind of well, they were just kind of messed up. Yeah, sorry to hear that. So, did you keep in touch with the family during your tours in Vietnam? Uh, sometimes we could mm -hmm. if we could. You know, uh, when, when, uh, but then after a while, you just kind of, I don't know, you kind of drift away with it. And uh, but every once in a while, we will have uh, maybe a sister or a, one of the parents, or you know, when we have our reunions, you mm -hmm. know, and, and we leave it open. If any of them want to come, they can come. When you're more than happy mm -hmm. to have them come to our reunions, and that's helped us a great deal. Okay. What about media reports on Vietnam? Uh, to me, it was it was a farce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it, uh, it seemed like the only thing that came out of Vietnam on the, the media reports uh, was nothing to do but what we were doing to the enemy. Mm -hmm. They never reported on what the enemy did to the guys that went over there, and. A lot of it we don't talk about. A lot of it we'll never talk about. Mm -hmm. And uh, but yeah, we were kind of we were, we were kind of let down by the media, you know, uh, in most cases. And uh, of course, the, you know, they you know, military is doing good. That don't sell news. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so whatever they could sell, they, that's what they talked mm -hmm. about. Okay. Um, what about the protests that were taking place? Well, that that kind of irked us. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and a lot of the guys stayed over there. They wouldn't come home because they kept volunteering and uh, to stay there. Or if they were sent home, it's like 30, 90 days. They would to go back mm -hmm. because they didn't like being home. And it, it happened, I, I guess, to most of us. Uh, I know when I came home and uh, the first time uh, I got off a, a civilian airline in L.A., yeah, me and the guy that came home together, we were spit at and jeered at and stuff, you know. But we just kind of gritted our teeth and ignored it. You mm -hmm. know, so what caused the ruckus, you know, is, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that hurt us a lot. Yeah, has the attitude changed since then? Uh, maybe with a few, few of the guys, mm -hmm. but not many. Uh, 
I know there's a lot of stuff that went on that we will never change because, uh, and uh, you know, what gets us the most is people that did the jeering and the tomato throwing, the name calling and all of this, most of them went on to be congressmen and senators and presidents of the United States. So uh, you know, we just kind of look at it, well, you know, they mm -hmm. did their what they want to do, we did what we want to do. So okay. we kind of ignore it. Well, so to, through two, uh, two tours of Vietnam, you all also had a wife and family to um, worry about. Yeah, we did, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anybody that, uh, the married guys, worried about their family back home. Cause we normally, depend on uh, if it was the first trip or the second trip, we normally had a, one child or we had, you know, we had two kids. Yeah, we worried about them because mm -hmm. we knew that uh, they could be killed or harmed or mm -hmm. something at, at any time given during the day or night. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it happened. Some of the wives would get phone calls and get weird messages that, you know, hey, your husband just killed a kid and he got killed, you know, da-da-da-da. And uh, so I think, uh, I think the military was, was a little bit let down by the people back here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but that's, hey, that's life. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when did you end your second tour of Vietnam? Uh, I came home in uh, 71. Okay, and you were then sent to Okinawa? Well, oh. no, for okay. Okinawa, mm -hmm. <laughs> I went to the Philippines. Philippines, okay. All right. And uh, yeah, we came back when we pulled out of Vietnam, we came back to uh, Camp Colton, California, and I was there about nine months. Mm -hmm. And then I got orders to go to the Philippines in security. Security, okay. And what did you, um, what was happening in the Philippines with security? Well, we were, uh, uh, the Marine Corps had a Marine barracks over at uh, Subic Bay. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, we would uh, have, uh, we took care of the security of the ammunition depot and the uh, other stuff. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Barracks, uh, I guess, had about 300 people in it. And uh, I had one part of it which had 89 people. Mm -hmm. And of course, I had the uh, uh, top secret clear clearance area that at yeah. that time with about 89 guys. And then it was Okinawa. And then it was Okinawa. And I had security over there. Mm -hmm. And because uh, <laughs> uh, I got off the plane, and uh, and I just knew I was going to the Ninth Marines because they were up mm -hmm. north uh, on the island, and I was hoping I wouldn't go up there. Then. And some major come over and told me, he says, "You're not going to the Ninth Marines. You're going up to Camp Hanson. You're going to be run the security." I said, mm -hmm. "Okay, I could buy that." <laughs> <laughs> And then what happened after Okinawa? Well, we came home after Okinawa, and uh, we went to Camp Lejeune. Mm -hmm. And I spent my twilight cruise, if you want to call it a twilight cruise. So I spent three years there, and that's why I retired. And that brings us to about 1980? 30 July, 1980. Okay. And what happened after you retired? Well, uh, I headed south. Mm -hmm. And uh, I bu I'd bought some property uh, when it was uh, stationed up in Connecticut down there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I figured, hey, we got the property. We just go down and see what happens. Mm -hmm. So, and, But eventually we both got pretty good jobs. And uh, then we had our home built. And we was there until about 93, 94. And uh, of course I had a business, so in 93 I sold it. Mm -hmm. Because I had a heart attack. Yeah. And what were, what was your business? Uh, landscaping. Landscaping. And uh, so we sold our home, and mm -hmm. and uh, my wife and I talked about it, and, and uh, said, "Well, we're going to retire, 
So what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. She says, I want to travel. I said, me too. So that's when we sold our home and mm -hmm. we bought an RV. And, wow. And now we have an RV, a truck, and a motorcycle. <laughs> and we're still traveling. <laughs> Yeah, so your wife was telling me, you've been all around the country? And oh, we have. Mm -hmm. uh, enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, you know, yeah, there's a lot of people retire. Mm -hmm. And they stay home. And you, can't, you know, you can't blame them. But they're mm -hmm. like here, you know, uh, her sister, uh, she never left native. But to us, uh, being in other countries, this is the greatest country on earth. Mm -hmm and God gave it to us. And uh, so I say to anybody, if you want to retire, get you an RV and at least go to traveling six months out of the year. Mm -hmm. And then come back home, if you live up here, mm -hmm. settle down to the snow. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, before you went extensive traveling, you also had a son who, was, who went to right. the Navy. Uh, he uh, went into the Navy after he graduated high school. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, he went into, uh, I think he went into electronics mm -hmm. because he, he had, uh, he almost had a genius IQ and he loved electronics, did, you know, mm -hmm. messing with stuff. And uh, so that's what he did for a little part of his life. And mm -hmm. of course, when he was involved in an automobile accident, it mm -hmm. kind of, Way laid that now, so yeah. so he's retired. And you have a, currently a grandson stationed in Iraq. Oh yeah, Tony. Yeah, yeah. very proud of him. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we get a call once in a while, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm very proud of him. And, uh, so, but he gets out. I think he gets out in December, and he's going to California to go to school. Mm -hmm. And uh, gonna do something with. Uh, yeah, I, I know it's in the medical field, but. Okay. Uh, it's to dealing with machines. All right. So, um, what do you, do you think? There's a different perception as to folks who are serving in today's military as to when you served. I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, as we talk to the guys that you know that comes back from over there, uh, I mean, we don't talk to them about well, did you see this, did you see that, or that. Mm -hmm. But we do talk talk to them about you know how how do you feel. You know, coming back now, mm -hmm. spending a year over there, and in some cases, two or three years, because you know the guys will come back four months, they're gone back again. You know, it's, uh, uh, I don't like this type of, you know, go over for a year, come back, go over for a year, come back. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have enough people to give them a break. So, uh, but I don't run the country. So, mm -hmm. and uh, but most of them are are uh, happy with what they did. And what they're doing, and then when of course they they coming back now, everybody is a homecoming, mm -hmm. and this helps a great deal. You know, you don't see the people out there, you know, marching and all this other crap, and now they're behind the military, mm -hmm. and that's where we should be. Okay. Anything else you want to say uh, for those who will be watching this tape in the future? Well, I, I just say this to any young man or young lady, is a lot of us come from the areas where we cannot afford, where our parents can't afford, you know, to send us to colleges or universities. But the military is the best stepping stone that they can find. Because you want to go to college, the military uh, meets uh, every dollar you put in for education. Mm -hmm. So when you get out, now you get money to go to college. Or you can go uh, uh, while you're in high schools. In colleges, if you're lucky to go to college, join ROTC programs. This is a great way to get a college education. Bought and paid for. And that's what I I, I tell the young guys and young gals, don't throw the military down the drain. Mm -hmm. If you try everything else, but if you can't do it, 
you got the military that says you can do it. Mm -hmm. so. Before we end this interview, Dan, have you ever seen the Vietnam Wall or have you ever taken part in any Vietnam Memorial ceremonies? Yes, I have. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in uh, recruiting duty here in Hartford, Connecticut, yeah, we'd go out and do uh, honor guard for uh, the deceased servicemen coming back. Mm -hmm. uh, then after I retired, uh, I joined the Marine Corps League and <clears throat> we would go out and, and do the honors, the full military honors for the people being buried in the national cemeteries. Mm -hmm. And it didn't matter what branch of service they were in, we were always there. And uh, uh, working with youth, yeah, I worked with the youth about 10 years. and. Uh, that was a great job, mm -hmm. and uh, working with kids, eight to 18, 21 in, in some cases. And there were the Young Marines. Mm -hmm. It's a national or organization, and I recommend any Marine Corps unit out here, whether they're a retired unit or a war veterans type thing, if they're the Marines, get in touch with somebody and work with these kids. Mm -hmm. All right, well, Dan Hubbard, I thank you for your participation in the Native Veterans Oral History Program. You're welcome, thank, thank you. you.